she's posing to us. <laughs> X-rated, X-rated pose. Yeah. <laughs> That was, that was pretty funny. On our seventh day of our trip, we finally made it to the promised land of Jerusalem. This was a fully packed day with many places to see and experience, including the path where Jesus walked. We also saw the Damascus Gate, Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Church of All Nations, and the Western Wall, just to name a few. Okay, which would probably even been higher 2,000 years ago and the valley was definitely lower. So we're talking about a very, very high spot. Uh, the dome behind it is called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, the most important mosque in Jerusalem. At some point we will definitely be hearing the call for prayer from that point. Okay, now uh, from that grey dome, if you go left and behind it, the area you see behind the, the arches, that's the Jewish quarter of the walled city, the Jewish quarter. Um, and then you see an area of trees behind the wall. Behind those trees, that is the Armenian quarter. Armenian Christians, the first nation to adopt Christianity as a state religion were the Armenians. They've been coming to Jerusalem for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, so you've got the Jewish quarter, you've got the Armenian quarter. Okay, and then continue uh, straight across to where you see the two grey domes, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which is the center of the Christian quarter of the wall city. And then once again, the Muslim quarter where the gold dome is and the area, the largest of the four quarters is the Muslim quarter. You've got nearly 35,000 people that are living under very crowded conditions inside the wall city. And when you consider that uh, the Jewish quarter and the Armenian quarters are not very crowded, that gives an added uh, crowdedness to the, to the Muslim quarter and the Christian quarter. Population density in the walled city, 70 people per quarter of an acre. Wow. Okay. Very, very dense living. Yeah. I mean, you can just glance at it and, and uh, okay. Now, the southern wall, the southern wall, okay, two gates in the southern wall. Uh, you see at the end with that, but those buses, there's a white bus and two other buses in front of it. That's the area of the dung gate. Now, from the, the southern wall is a southern wall from the 16th century. The southern wall at the time of Jesus incorporated a much larger area, the south. It, you can follow the Kidron Valley all the way to the left. And then there's another valley. Don't struggle to see it if you can see it. Otherwise, you can get up later on and get a view, which is Gehenna. Okay, so the two valleys meet, merge. Okay, and in fact, there is a third valley that we'll talk about later on when we have a view onto it. I'm not going to talk about it now because you really can't see it. But in fact, there are three valleys. Three valleys, right. Um, now, can you see an orange roof? A very, 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 yes. only one orange roof. To the right of it, you see a grey dome. Yes. That is uh, St. Peter in Galicantu. We'll be there when we leave the Mount of Olives, the house of Caiaphas. You can see that's outside the city, but that was inside the city 2,000 years ago, right? Very close to that is the area of the upper room, which is also outside the city. Both of those were inside the city because the whole south included a much larger area than you see over there. What's that? There would have been a wall. Yeah, there would have been a wall. Definitely would have been a wall. Yeah. Okay. Um, look. Yes, of my shoe. Okay. Uh, my friend, you see where you see, go back to the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, you see people sitting over there? Okay, yes. well, you're also going to be sitting there, maybe today and maybe tomorrow, depends on how the time goes. That is a very, very significant area. Jesus would have gone into Jerusalem by way of that stairway. Now, from that stairway, you go to the road and then you go, follow the buildings down. Can you see one with kind of a wooden roof? You know what I'm talking about? It's about one, two, three, four, five, six buildings. You can see a wall and a wooden roof. 
Yeah, you can see it. Yes. That is the area where Jerusalem began. That is the Jebusite city, the city of David. Okay? Which during the time of Jesus was the lower city. The lower city, the less wealthy lived, the upper city, where the house of Caiaphas is, where the priests, the Levites, etc., the, the wealthy of Jerusalem lived. So we've seen a bunch of things in the in the life of Jesus. We've seen the upper room. Guys, where's the upper room? Which area? The upper room is up there, in the upper city, up there. Okay? The Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Above the Garden of Gethsemane are golden domes. Mary Magdalene Church, Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus spends the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where is he taken from the Garden of Gethsemane? Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Where's Caiaphas? No, no, no. No. Annas is uh, Annas first, then Caiaphas. Oh, there we go. Sorry, get it right, guys. Three trials. Annas, Caiaphas, and Pilate. That's all right. Okay, so, so that's back up to the where the priests were, up to the upper city. Okay, and then to the area of the trial. Now, where was the area of the trial? And understand that when Herod the Great made a platform, put a temple on the top, he wanted to control that area. And only Jews were allowed in the temple. How do you have control over it? If you build a fort and you've got the Roman soldiers on the top of that fort and they can point the binoculars into the temple. Because only Jews are allowed in the area of the temple. Makes Herod feeling very neurotic now. Can you see, go to the gold dome and go to the right, you see a little silver dome? Yes. That is where a fortress was built by the time of Herod the Great called Antonia Fortress, named after Mark Antony. We will be there, okay? And that, there was a big fortress that overlooked the temple, which was where the gold dome is approximately, approximately, okay? So uh, that is the area of trial. So from the house of Caiaphas, taken to Pilate and then from Pilate to Calvary. We can't see the location. It's too low from this point over here.
here at the uh, Western Wall. This is a place where it's uh, very significant to the Jews. They come here to pray. They come here to put in a note in between the cracks of the wall and praying that uh, the wishes come true. Nathan Yahoo came here the night before elections, put his prayer in the wall, and apparently it worked. I think within the year, there were three elections, and this was his third one, and he got it. something that people are going to see and are going to impress people and people are going to ooh and ah. So what am I going to do? I'm going to chop off the northern corner of the uh, area and I'm going to put on... Wow! That's it! Yeah. Here we've got 35 wow. acres of platform. Wow. Okay, would you imagine that you put the temple over here? Okay, who would like to place the temple for me? Ooh. Do it, Barbara. I'll do it. Go on. How are you going to put it? Aww. I'm going to put it. Right here. Well done. Ah. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Entrance, balustrade around here. No, only Jews were allowed to proceed beyond that point. They could come up here, they could go there, they could go there, but to the area of the temple only. Jews were allowed, the women's court, four corners, court of Israel, the Holy of Holies. Where is the Wailing Wall? The Western Wall. The Wailing Wall, west part of the Western platform, on which was constructed by Herod. Okay, it is not immediately opposite the Holy of Holies. In fact, it's here. Okay, it's in this area over here. Okay, the year 70, we destroy the temple. Okay, and this little building goes over here, and it doesn't matter which way we put it. Okay. And then, in the 13th and 14th century, people want to live very close to the Dome of the Rock, and there's a valley over here, low down. So what do they do? They elevate their houses, and here we go. Whoops. Can you grab the time, please? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, right, there you go. Now, this is the public prayer area, and it's not opposite the Holy of Holies. Okay? We'll see this now as we walk along the tunnel. We will get to the place where the uh, we are exactly opposite what we think is the Holy of Holies. All right? Here you've got the temple. Here you've got the Antonia Fortress. And here is outlined the public prayer area as you see it today. Okay? Which is way above the street level. Okay. okay. Now, I'm going to show you view 360 degrees. The southern side. We'll be standing on these, sitting on those stairs. That's the southern side, that's the eastern side, and the northern side. This is the Antonia Fortress. I'm getting a little dizzy I over know. here. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> now a view that's above. Okay, stop. Oh. A view from above. Oh, man, that's oh. Okay. <laughs> Guys, you can take pictures. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Video. Snap yeah, oh. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's a picture that was up when we came in. Okay, I'm sorry about this, but. Oh, destruction. Wow. Oh, wow. To the year 70, wow. destruction of the city. You will see that only a few of the stones have remained. Yes. So what you see that building yes. up is from later periods. Remember I said only seven rows of stones, which would be this area over there, you could see. Guys, if there's anything I'm saying, but I'm saying it a little faster than I normally do, then just, you know, stop me. Okay.
Okay, so this is the, the, the Muslim period, the early Muslim period. The houses that are built are built in the, in the later Muslim period. This is the early Muslim period. 691 this building is constructed, the Dome of the Rock. 691. Okay. So for those 700 years between 70 and 691, yeah. it was just rubble. Okay. There was mainly right. rubble, mainly rubble. Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian, built a small temple at the top, but really it is not, uh, that's all there is. Very, very little, yeah. Okay, now we get to the Mameluk period, okay, 13th century. Here you've got the whole series of houses that are now attached. Okay, now you can see the western wall, okay. And what we did in 1967 was we opened the whole area. Okay. Do anybody ever listen to podcasts? You know what I'm talking about when I say podcasts? Yes. Yes. Okay. There is a, a, um, a series of podcasts called Israel's Story. Israel's Story. And they have got a, it's in English, and they've got a series on the wall. Listen to the first episode. Okay, it's a phenomenal story of the a true story of the war. Okay, the Western War. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into the. It's a very long story, but it's, it's definitely worth listening to. Way down, we don't know that. Uh, did he stop here? Did Christ stop here? We built this. We don't know that either. Okay, this just happens to be a place where they built the church and uh, people come. But it is a reminder that the event did happen. Luke chapter 19, uh, which says the verses 41 to 44. And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, "If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes." For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The time of your visitation. You know what? If I had the time, I could take you all the way back to the book of Daniel. Take you back to, to the time in which... Uh, uh, the, the prophecy of Daniel's 70th week and understand how it is we know uh, uh, 188,000 so many days it was that Christ rode to the city it was prophesied by Daniel the prophet uh, but they didn't recognize the time of their visitation you see that's why Christ says if you've known the time you should know the time I mean after all you're in the synagogue all the time you read the book of Daniel you should know but they didn't know because he had not anticipated him anymore. You know, when, when he came down, and I'm not going to necessarily go through the outline, just say a couple things here, but when he came down and they, they put the palm branches down, they put the garments down, uh, it's a symbol of submission. And uh, if you read the account in, in the other, other Gospels, it was all about Hosanna to the Son of the Most High. Hosanna to the Lord God of Israel. They, they were seeing praises. They, they recognized Christ as their king, but they didn't recognize him as the king as he was presented truly, but as a the king they wanted him to be. They wanted him to be the king because of the miracles. Because they, you see, they loved him not because of the message, but because of the miracles. Okay? The message offended them. The miracles they loved. Everybody loves the miracles when they're healed, right? It's the message that, that, that just was a deterrent to everything that they wanted to see happen. And our Lord would come and he'd weep over the city, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If, if they would just known the day of their visitation, if they just would have paid attention and listened to the prophets. But Jerusalem was a place that stoned the prophets. They killed them. That's what they were known for. 
killing the prophets because the prophets would point them back to God and yet they wanted nothing to do with God. And you, the unique thing about this is that all the praise was foreknown and foreseen in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Behold, your king comes on the backside of a donkey. Your king comes and the people of the Lord will praise his name. So everything was prophesied. It was prophesied because, yeah, he was going to come on the backside of a donkey. He did. It was prophesied that people would praise him, and they did. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1, it was prophesied he would come to his uh, to the temple suddenly, and he did. Everything was prophesied. And so we stop here just for a brief moment to take you back and realize that there are so many things about the Messiah that we miss. We can't afford to be like the Jews in the time of Christ when they had the obvious writings of Scripture. They had the prophets who spoke to them about the coming Messiah, and yet they missed him. You know, remember with the, the, the Greeks, when they came to Philip, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Remember that? And Philip would take him to Andrew, and Andrew would take him to the Lord, because Andrew always brings people to the Lord. That's what he does in Scripture. And, and yet, the fact of the matter is, is that they didn't see him. They didn't see him for who he was. And my prayer for you and for me is that we would see Christ for who he really is. And we'd embrace him in the reality of who he is, that we might glorify his name. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for today, a chance to be here as brief as it is, but to be reminded once again of the glory of your coming and to realize that, Lord, somewhere on this mount, you would stop and you would, under the praise of all the people, weep over a city that you knew would reject you. They praised you on Monday. They wanted to kill you on Friday. So we pray, Lord, that our perspective would be true and pure about our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, if you're on page 116, I'm going to read some things from the book of Zechariah that will set the tone for what it is we're about here. In, in Zechariah chapter 14, it says this in verse number one, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord uh, when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle in the city, will be captured in the house, plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off in the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, but he fights on a day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's where you are right now. On the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Okay? Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will be moved toward the north and the other half toward the south now you'll, you'll recall that uh, this is not, not just the Mount of Olives it's, it's the mountain of separation okay in, in the second century uh, there was a rabbi uh, a Jewish sage uh, Rabbi Hakiva, who uh, was the, from what I understand, is the one who started the Jews play, praying at the Western Wall. Now the Western Wall is between where you see the 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 the, the dark uh, Al Aqsa Mosque and the dark cover of the Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, where those trees are down toward that area. The Western Wall is not part of the wall of the original temple. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a retaining wall, is what it is. But it's not a retaining wall for the original temple. It's a retaining wall for, uh, for, for the city itself. Well, you need to understand that. So he got them to pray there looking this way. Why? Because the western wall looks directly where? To the Mount of Separation. Okay? Because they, they, they are praying and anticipating. The, remember the 12th article of the Jewish creed? How I wait daily for the arrival of the Messiah? and they are anticipating the coming of Messiah. So if you can get them in front of the Western Wall praying toward looking at the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Separation, because Zechariah 14 tells us it's gonna separate, it's called the Mount of Separation, and so they pray in anticipation for that. So I don't like to call it the Western Wall necessarily, but I have to call it the Waiting Wall, okay? It's the Waiting Wall. Some people call it the Wailing Wall, right? Now, th that could be true if you look at 2 Chronicles 36, which, by the way, is the last chapter of the Jewish Bible. It's not the book of Malachi. It's 2 Chronicles 36 because the Old Testament ends with the destruction of the temple on the Temple Mount. Okay? And so they could be there wailing and bemoaning the sins of their people, Israel, 
and what took place as to why there is no temple now on the Temple Mount. So that could be true. It could be called a wailing wall because of that, all right? Uh, so they're lamenting. You read the book of uh, Lamentations, and they are lamenting the destruction uh, of their nation and what has taken place. But on top of that, it is truly a waiting wall because they are praying, waiting, and anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. They are longing for that day, like we are. We are longing for the Messiah, but we are longing for his return, not his first coming, you see? So we can buy into the 12th article of the Jewish creed, knowing what it says, but knowing what we believe about the arrival of the Messiah. <laughs> So all that to say is that the arrival of the king is a sure event. Amen. It's absolute. Amen. Jesus is coming again. Yeah. The Messiah is going to arrive again. Yeah. We, don't, we don't speculate about that. It's an absolute sure event. So when Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, Acts chapter 1, verse number 11, and he ascends up in the glory, and there are two men in white apparel. Some say they're angels. Not so sure. It doesn't say they're angels. Some think they are. Not so sure. Could be Enoch. Could be Elijah. Don't know, so don't be dogmatic that they're angels. We don't know that, okay? There are two men in white apparel. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Do you not know that this same Jesus will return in the same manner in which he left? It does not say he's going to return to the same spot in which he left. Please keep your finger in the text, knowing exactly what it says. He will return in the same manner. Sure enough, he will. He will return in the same manner, but not to the same spot, but he will eventually come to the Mount of Olives because we told you before, we're Isaiah 63, Isaiah chapter 34, the book of Haggai, the book of Malachi. He returns to Bozrah because he has a sword satiated in Edom because he's going to destroy those who come against his people Israel. I was watching a doc, fascinating, I was watching TV today before I left, and I don't watch TV in Israel. He had a documentary on Petra. Anybody see that this morning? Amazing. They're talking about how they built the, uh, how the Nabataeans had built it all out and everything and why it was the perfect city uh, for, for people to hide in and, and for, for trade and for commerce and for water. How yeah, it was the perfect location in the whole area. For a thousand miles around, it's a perfect location. When we get there, we'll talk about why that's, why that's the wilderness in Revelation chapter 12, why Israel flees the wilderness, why in that location. It's just, it's just amazing. But that's where, that's, uh, Bozrah is the ancient capital of Edom. And that's where that's where the Messiah returns, based on Isaiah's prophecy, when he sees the Lord coming from Bozrah and his garments already stained in blood. Okay, they're already stained in blood. So if that's the case, he's already tread the wine press alone. He's already engaged in the battle alone. Okay? But the Bible tells us in Zechariah chapter 14, then the Lord may then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. If you go back to the book of Revelation 19, that's us, man. That's us. We're coming. We're coming. We don't get to fight. We get to watch the fight, right? Amen. And we, but we get to return with him. Uh, and that's going to be just a, a, a beautiful thing. But this is a, a, a sure event. It, it's going to be a surprising event, okay? The, the Bible says that no man knows the day nor the hour, okay? So the exact hour is the hour you do not know. He's going to come in an hour you don't expect him to come. That's the hour. And we don't know when that's going to be. And that's okay. We don't need to know that because we're going to come back with him. And the, and, and the important thing is, it's going to be a complete, surprising event. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Mark. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heavens, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together its elect from the four winds, from the farthest ends of the earth to the farthest ends of heaven. Why? Be judgment. Where's the judgment going to take place? Right there. Valley Jehoshaphat. Valley decision. Book of Joel, second chapter. Okay? The Kitchen Valley, Valley of Jehoshaphat, Valley decision. Why? Because all those, listen carefully, all those, all those soldiers who left the city to cross over the Kitchen, okay? Where, where, where blood would be flowing for the sacrifice of animals who did not make a decision to follow the Messiah. A decision would be made for them because they did not. And the judge makes the decision. And what did you do it? In the valley decision. This is just so good. I could be here all day. This is just so amazing to understand all this because it just kind of puts things together for you. And, and I, I, I wish I had time, and I, I told Nola I wasn't going to speak more than, what did I tell you, 10 minutes? Did I say, did I say 11? How long is it? 40. <laughs> I lied. Uh -oh. Sorry. Okay, so it's going to be surprising. It's going to be a supernatural event. It's going to be a sobering event. Why? 
because the Lord's going to deal out retribution upon all those who don't believe Him. It's going to be a sanctifying, sanctifying event, Second Peter 3. Everybody who has this hope in Him sanctifies himself, right? And, and there's this the great sanctifying aspect, purifies himself even as he himself is pure by anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. It's such a, such a beautiful thing. It, it's going to be a very selective event. How do we know that? Listen to this. Uh, and it will come about in all the lands, Zechariah 13, verse number 8, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire. We find them as silver as you find, and test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. There will be two-thirds left, and two, uh, 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 I mean two-thirds that will perish in the tribulation, and one-third that will, that will survive. Remember, the, the, the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble, according to Jeremiah chapter 30. Okay? It's designed specifically for the Jewish nation, because God's going to refine for himself a group of people. He's going to take one third out of that and bring them to himself. Oh, by the way, remember Zechariah? I know my time is gone. No, no, please forgive me. This is a sovereign event. God's in charge of all this. But listen to this. Zechariah 13, verse number 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Who's, who's, who's God's shepherd? That's Messiah, right? Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Because the shepherds of Israel did not lead them properly. So God's going to send forth his shepherd, the Messiah, to shepherd his people Israel. Okay? And against the man. What man? Not a normal man, but a strong man, a mighty man, Geber, which is which where we get our word Gabor. He's a mighty strong man. Now listen to this. You ready for this? Okay. My shepherd is a man. He is my associate. In Hebrew, it's the word is he's my equal. So whoever the man is, is the shepherd. Whoever the shepherd is, is the equal to the Lord God Yahweh. Awesome. That's what he says. And he says, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord. You know, the, the Bible is so clear about prophecy, and I, I, I could spend years here. I, I just love to move the church to Israel just to have a prophetic church and just talk about prophecy all the time. Because when Jesus comes, he's coming here, okay? He's going to set up his kingdom right here on the throne of his father David. By the way, which is on the hill of Ephel, which is right down there. Which will show you the city of David tomorrow. It's going to be a great time. I wish I had more to share, you, share with you, but I don't. So, all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. It could be that this could be the vicinity of where the upper room was. All right? That's a good possibility. But we don't know for certain. And that's okay. Because, you know, uh, <coughs> if, if we knew where it was, There'd be all kinds of problems. But anyway, all that to say is that, you know, the upper room was a, was a very significant place. And in Luke's gospel, I'm not sure what page we're on. 144. Debbie knows. 144. What is it? 92. 92, 144. Are you sure? Upper room. Upper room. 144, yeah. Wow, Luz. Whoa. You mean this is straight. What, what are you doing down there? Too much falafel. Okay. Yeah. Got job so, so just to let you know, you know, <laughs> this it really is a unique and special place. Even though no one can guarantee this is a spot, we know that maybe a possible definite maybe that there was a first century church in this location. Okay, so we can we can deduce from that that uh, this is a good possibility. But when you go to Luke's, I mean, uh, John's Gospel in the 13th chapter, it says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come. You know, the upper room was a place of predetermination. Predetermination. It was all about his hour. And John's Gospel spends a lot of emphasis talking about the hour, right? Uh, and mentions it seven times to let you know that everything about John's gospel focuses on the deity of Christ, but moves us toward the hour in which his deity was put on display the most, that is, through his death, because no one took his life from him. He laid it down on, on his own initiative. So we know that from uh, John 13, verse number 1, that the Passover, the upper room, was a place of, of um, predetermination. On top of that, it says this, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's also a place of affection, great affection. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them completely until the end. 
And, and, and the word that's used there talks about the all-encompassing love of God as it, as it relates to the people of God. And so when you come to the upper room, you realize that there was a supreme love that God had for his, his own. And when it says he loved them completely to the end, he's talking about the men that were with him. And that would be all 12, but that would even include Judas because he was among the 12 who were with him during the, during the Passover. And so you begin to see some of the uniqueness of our Lord's love for even Judas as it pertains to their relationship, as it uh, pertains to the relationship he has with the other 11. But he loved them completely to the end. So it, it becomes a place of affection in which he's going to demonstrate in a unique and special way something that goes beyond anything we can ever imagine. Because not only that, it's a place of supreme humiliation. For he says this, these words. It says, And during supper, the devil, having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself about. Now, why did he do that? Because if you read Luke's gospel, remember, you got to read all the gospels together to get the full picture. We know that an argument ensued among the 12. The same argument that had happened on several other occasions about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Now, remember, Jesus is going to die tomorrow, the next day, right? He knows that. And so he wants to have this last supper with his men. But all they can think of, uh, of is themselves, except our Lord, he thinks of them. They can only think of themselves. So he's about to die, and they're all about, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And they all have an argument as who's, who's, who's the greatest, who's the best. And so it's a place of humiliation because our Lord gets up, and he girds himself. And as the text goes on to say, he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now remember... Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, would use the phrase that uh, in 1 Peter 5, 5, talking about how we are to humble ourselves. Remember that? And he talks about the, the, uh, the fact that we are to, to take a slave's apron and gird ourselves. He talks about the humiliation, referring back in Peter's epistle to this night that took place somewhere in this vicinity with our Lord, where he humbled himself and began to wash the disciples' feet. You know the conversation they had. Peter says, Lord, what are you doing? You can't wash my feet. Christ says, you don't want, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. He says, okay, throw the whole thing on me. He says, no, Peter, you don't need a bath. You just need a daily cleansing, right? And then he says these words. He says this, For I gave you an example that you, should, that you also should do as I did to you. Truly I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed. If you do them, John 13, verses 15, 16, and 17. And so, some people think, well, he set an example that he sh we should wash one another's feet. Again, like Canaan and Galilee. If you come up with that conclusion, you've missed the boat when it comes to understanding the upper room and what Christ was doing. He wasn't doing things so you could wash each other's feet. That's not, that's not the purpose. Here's the purpose. When... When you are experiencing the greatest amount of pain, no matter what it may be, and Christ is going to die the next day, he's going to suffer for the sins of the world, right? What do you do? You serve your fellow man. That's the example. In fact, when, when you are in the worst amount of pain, the worst amount of rejection, when people don't love you as you think you should be loved, he could be saying, time out, guys, wait a minute, wait a, wait a second, what about me? Guys, I'm dying for your life tomorrow. Can't you at least grab my hand and, you know, pray with me, sing kumbaya, do something <laughs> together as a group that we can just bond together. Can't we, can't you just think of me for a moment? He never said that. Never said that. Now, would he have the right to do so? Yes, he would. But he didn't. Because in his humiliation, in his humiliation, he wanted to make sure that he set an example for his men to follow that they would learn to humble themselves and stop thinking about themselves because all they could do is argue about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Get your eyes off yourself and start serving your fellow man. Listen, I don't care what kind of pain you're in. I'll tell you a perfect example. is Gil and Martha Saldana, who are not with us, who call me and tell me they're praying for me, ask me how the day went, saying we're so glad that the day went well for everybody and everybody's safe and they're praying for us and praying for me and everything. And all they can think of is us and he's sitting in the bed, can't get out of it. You see, you know, so many times we get so wrapped up in ourselves that we, we just want people to always be consumed with us. Christ was the direct opposite, right? 
The upper room was a place of humiliation, a place where he demonstrated to his men, this is how you live your life. Serve your fellow man. And when do you serve him the most and the best? When you are the most rejected, the most isolated, the most in pain, serve your fellow man. And that's where the joy of the Lord is. That's why it says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, right? The true blessing comes in giving towards others, not letting them serve you. You can go on, and, and we won't go through much more, but it talks about the fact it's a place of prediction as he talks to uh, Joseph about what he's to do. Uh, it's also a place of instruction as he instructs him concerning his own life and what he wants for them. It, it's a place of declaration. Remember John 13, 34, and 35? A new commandment I give unto you, okay? A new commandment I give unto you. And you can think the disciples are thinking, another one? We got another one to obey? He says, a new commandment I give unto you, okay? And that is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. Because loving one another as you love yourself is no longer adequate. Loving one another as I have loved you is now the standard. The standard is just, you've seen my life. You've seen what I've done. You've been with me for three years. You've seen tonight. This is the new standard. You love as I have loved you. And then on top of that, this whole place becomes a, a place of transformation. Remember, he, they, they had the supper. He takes the third cup. Remember that? The, third, the, the cup of blessing. It's the cup of redemption. Very precise. It's a place of transformation because he's going to transform that cup of blessing and say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is given for you. He's going to ratify the new covenant through the sacrifice of his life on Calvary's cross. It's a life of transformation. So therefore, listen, you have celebrated the Passover up to this point, looking at the fact that you've been delivered from Egyptian bondage, looking about the fact that I am your deliverer, your redeemer. And what do we tell you? I've been telling you all week that the memorial name for our Lord, Yahweh, is the fact that he's a deliverer, a savior, and a redeemer. So you have celebrated all these years, the Passover. You have celebrated everything up to this point because everything about the Passover prefigures and foreshadows all that I'm going to do for you tomorrow. And now I'm going to transform the third cup, the cup of blessing, the cup of redemption, and say now this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As Do this as often as you drink it in my name. And so what he's going to do now is he's taking that cup and saying, okay, now... Your physical deliverance from Egypt was one thing, but your spiritual deliverance is a whole new nother ballgame. And I'm going to live a life of spiritually delivering people's lives. And so when we gather together in a place like the, the upper room, and even though it's not an exact location, we can look back and remember that this place, this situation, was one of predetermination, all designed by God. A, a place of affection where the, the Lord Jesus loved his men. A, a place of humiliation where he would serve his men. A place of instruction where he, where he would tell them that, listen, in the midst of your greatest pain, serve your fellow man. It's a, it's a place of uh, uh, transformation because he transformed that cup of blessing by ratifying it through his blood that would be shed on Calvary's tree. And that's why we're here. That's why we come to this place. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can spend a few moments here and ask that, Lord, as we go through the rest of this day, you protect us and keep us safe. And may we remember, Lord, the example that you set, that, Lord, we would follow your example and that we would be a servant of all. And that, Lord, no matter what the pain we're in, no matter how much we've been rejected and isolated, the greatest ministry before us is to serve those who are still in great need. And so we ask that you'd use us in that way. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Garden of Gethsemane, why are we here? Uh, what is this great place? Now, is this the actual place where Jesus prayed? Probably not. Okay. In the Church of All Nations, they have a huge stone. It's surrounded by a, a crown of thorns. And uh, they'll say that that's the stone that Jesus prayed on when he came here. Yeah, I don't know. You know, we don't know that. But we know that this is the Mount of Olives. We know that we are sinking down into the Kidron Valley. All right? Now, listen. We are going to give you so much information in two days, your head's going to spin. But if you just listen carefully, take notes, you'll be able to conceptualize everything and put it all together, where the Kidron Valley is, where the three valleys surrounding the city of David are, where uh, 
Caiaphas' house is, uh, where uh, the Antonio Fortress is, and uh, where Gogneth is. That's why I told you when you go by on the right hand side and you see and you see the uh, uh, the quarry, or you see the cut out of the mountain. Is it cut out of the mountain? It goes down and it's, and it's streets, and you come on the other side, and it's Gogneth on the other side. Yeah. There's a reason for that, and we get there. I'll explain that to you, so you understand Genesis chapter 22 how it all comes together for you. All that's very very important. The topography of the land is crucial. But we're here in Gethsemane because of several things. I want to go through this rather rapidly for you. Okay? I'm about to spend all the time that I can normally do because we had to be out of here at 8.45. I want to give you time to pray with your friends, with your loved ones uh, here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and then we got to be out of here at 8.45. Don't forget, this is here. Uh -oh. Nothing's free anymore. Okay? <laughs> so if you want to contribute, you can. It goes toward our opportunity to keep coming here. Okay, there was a day we could just walk in here and, and use this place. Not anymore. Okay, so uh, if you want to contribute, you can. Uh, the guy will hold on to this on the way out. You can put it in there, okay? Okay, so where are we? Uh, John chapter 18. What a beautiful passage of scripture. When Jesus spoke in these words, he went forth and his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron. Where is the Kidron? It's right here. Kidron Valley. Valley of Jehoshaphat, Kidron Valley, Valley of Decision. Three names, all same valley, okay? Hidden Valley, other side of the city. Central Valley goes up on the other side of the city of David. We'll show that to you. This is the Kidron Valley, all right? The Valley of Decision. So Christ would leave the upper room. We'll show you, we'll go to the upper room today. It's not the upper room, okay? It's in the vicinity of the upper room, and we'll tell you why we know that, okay? It's important to understand why we know it's in the vicinity. It is not the upper room but it's in the vicinity of where the upper room would be, okay? So they would leave that location, they would cross over the Kidron and ascend up the Mount of Olives. This is where you are now. You all with me? Amen. We're good, right? Okay, so it says, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. into which he himself entered in his disciples, and now Judas also was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. The first thing you need to know is that this is a place of dependence always was a place of dependence. That is, in, the, in our Lord's humanity, he lived a life of supreme dependence upon the Father. That's why he prayed so much. Remember in Capernaum, when he escaped off into the mountains to pray, remember that? Mm. After uh, the evening, the whole day there, we talked about that in the synagogue of uh, Capernaum, because he, that, that was his lifeline to the Father, was to communicate with the Father through prayer. And, and to, to model to his men the necessity and the, the, the understanding that we are dependent upon our Heavenly Father. And so Gethsemane is a place of dependence, but it's also a place of assistance because Luke is the only writer to record how angels would come to him in this garden of Gethsemane and assist him during his time of need. He would come here on the eve of the crucifixion. He would come here and he'd pray, sweat uh, great uh, drops of blood or sweat great drops of blood that whole uh, medical system uh, technology uh, uh, it's called hematidrosis I don't understand it all but it's exactly what took place and so he was in such agony not because he was gonna die please don't understand that not because he was gonna physically die but because of the spiritual separation he would experience from the father on the cross and that's why he said the only time in his earthly ministry my God my God why hast thou forsaken me every other time he called him father and we'll talk about that sometime today because you need to understand the significance of why Jesus called his father, Father, and no Jew would ever do that. Okay, very, very important. But we'll talk about that later. So it's a place of assistance because the angels would come and assist him in this place. A place of dependence because he would be in prayer. A place of assistance because of the ministry of the angels. It's also a place of obedience because he came to do the will of his father, right? Gethsemane, what do you learn? I, I, years ago, when I first came here, I, I called it Geth Seminary. Okay? Oh. Geth Seminary. Why? Because seminary can't teach you what you learn here in Geth Seminary. Seminary is a bunch of classroom, a bunch of head knowledge guys, a bunch of heady and intellectual guys. But what you need is Geth Seminary, hmm. where you learn to depend upon the Lord on your knees before the throne of grace, 
appealing to him, living that life of dependence, living that life of assistance, because we know that Hebrews 114, angels are ministering spirits. How they do that, don't know necessarily how it's all done for you and me, but the Bible does say they are ministering spirits. But it's a place of obedience. You come to Gethsemane, you learn about obedience because he came to do the will of his Father who is in heaven. And so he knew he was going to die. That was the plan from eternity past. He knew everything because he was living a life of complete submission to his Father. Not only was it a place of obedience, it was a place of omnipotence, a place of supreme power. Listen to this. It says, uh, For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Verse 3, Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Listen, they came with lanterns to look for the Lord of light. Right? They, 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 they came to fight the God of peace. They came with uh, torches and lanterns and swords and, and so you, you had the temple police and you had the Pharisees and Sadducees you had probably somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people that came to retrieve one man the temple police was 600 you had the scribes and the Pharisees you have others that were involved in that whole process so somewhere around 800 maybe 900 we don't know exactly the number but it was a lot of people they come down out of the city gates they come down this direction and they have these these torches and lanterns and Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane with his men so you see the glow and the flicker of the light coming he knows they're coming but it's a place of omnipotence read on and it says and Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to him, Whom do you seek? you got to love Jesus. He doesn't wait for them to come to him. He goes to them. Why? The epitome of leadership, always the initiative. Always the initiator. Never the recipient of someone else's initiative. The leader always initiates. And he is the consummate leader. He goes to them. Whom do you seek? And they say to him, what? Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus the Nazarene. That's who they are seeking. And he said to them, I am. Ego eimi. The Greek uh, translation of that, uh, those four Hebrew consonants in the book of Exodus. Yahweh. I am. That's who I am. And what happens? They immediately all fall backwards. It's a place of omnipotence. A great power. You're sitting in a place of great power. Who do you see? <coughs> I am. Woo! Bam! They all fall backwards. Hmm. Now, the amazing thing is not that they all fall backwards. The amazing thing is they get right back up again. That's what's so amazing. That just blows my mind. I, I think I would I would run the other way. <laughs> but no, they get right back up again, right? And it, it's it's Jesus's, you know, I hate to use the word sense of humor. Mm -hmm. but that's how he works. It's almost like, <clears throat> tell me again, whom do you see? Let me make sure you get it right. Who are you seeking? And they say the same thing. Jesus, the Nazarene. And it says these words. Uh, it says, uh, and Jesus answered, I told you that I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. A place of supreme omnipotence. What do you learn from Gethsemane? That God is all powerful. It's a place of omniscience, right? Because it says earlier, uh, uh, above, 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 above. Jesus knowing all things were at hand. He knows all things, right? It's a place of omniscience. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he set in order the events. Everything happened precisely as it was stated. Listen, we know he didn't come in on Palm Sunday. There is no Palm Sunday. It's only Palm Monday. There is no Sunday celebration. It's Monday. All you got to know is that he's in Bethany on Sunday. He's not in Bethany on Saturday. He's in Bethany on Sunday. And on Monday, he arrives in the city. Therefore, you have a count of every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If you have a Palm Sunday, you got a silent Wednesday. There's no silent Wednesday. Who came up with that idea? Okay? Because we wanted to celebrate a Palm Sunday. That's why. The bottom line is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are all mapped out precisely as God mapped them out. He knows all things. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He knows everything. And that's what Gethsemane teaches us. And also this, it's a place of non-resistance. Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? He is the, he is the lamb being led to the slaughter, right? He's not going to fight because 
This has all been preordained. This has all been set in stone. This is how it's going to be. It's, it's a place of non-resistance because he submits to the will of his Father. He knows that everything is on a sovereign timetable. Everything happens at the exact time, at the exact moment. The precision of the cross, the precision of the weeks and days and moments leading up to the cross proves to you once again the sovereign control of God over every single event in every person's life. It's just an amazing thing. A place of non-resistance, but listen to this, it's a place of benevolence. Benevolence! Whom do you seek? Jesus of, Naz of, 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 uh, of, of Nazareth. And they said, I told you that I am, therefore you seek me, let these go their way. That the word might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I lost not one. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus, therefore, said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Listen, it's a place of benevolence based on the fact that he protected his men and he provided for Malchus. Listen, you need to get this point. If you miss every other point I'm telling you, get this one. The place of Gethsemane is a place of benevolence, a place of extreme goodness. God is good. God only does good. And so he made sure that his men were protected to fulfill the word of the scripture. So his benevolence is seen in the protection of his men. His benevolence is seen in providing for Malchus. Who's Malchus? Malchus is the high priest's servant. Okay? Peter sitting back and saying, man, if the Lord can say a word and they all fall, fall backwards, we got this. So he draws his sword and he snips off the, the earlobe of, of, of mouth. It's not the whole ear, it's just the earlobe, if you read the text correctly. Mm -hmm. And so he knocks off this part of his ear. I think he was going for his head and missed, okay? <laughs> and, and, and knocked it off. And, and Christ says, put it back. In Luke's account, okay, in Luke's account, because Luke's a physician, remember that? Mm -hmm. Luke's a physician, so he's concerned about this, shows you how he provided. Listen, for mouth, because he healed his ear. Huh. He healed his ear. Here's the one who's going to die. Here's the one who they've come to capture. And he's always thinking of others. Okay, so listen carefully. This is the last miracle of Jesus. The last miracle. Think about the first miracle in Canaan, turning water into wine, right? Yeah. You'd think it'd be something more bodacious than that, but it wasn't. But it had highly significant meaning because he's going to transform the dirty lives and make them into the sweetest of all wine because he's the transformer of people's souls, right? Mm -hmm. So now you had the last miracle of Jesus. He, he didn't have to do this. Well, just let it go. He's not going to bleed to death. He can live without the, the earlobe. Unless, of course, he wears earrings, and then he's only going to have to wear one, but people only wear one today anyway, so what difference does it make, right? So, the, the bottom line is, who cares? Who cares? Jesus cares. Because this miracle, not only was his last miracle, it was the least of his miracles. The least. And not only was it the least, it was the loudest of his miracles. So the last miracle, which was his least miracle, happens to be the loudest miracle he ever performed because it is the loveliest miracle he ever performed because he who said, love your enemies, lived that to the very end. He loved his enemies, even though they came to kill him. That's Gethsemane. That's why we're here. And thus begins our day in the Garden of Gethsemane.